Well, uh, an advisement. Uh, I've got a bit of a long uh, introduction to the lesson this morning. Uh, lest we get into it and you go, is he going to deal with the passage? Uh, but it has to do with the subject matter. In this chapter, uh, we find two episodes in which Jesus is confronted by the Pharisees and their scribes over the proper observance of the Sabbath. Uh, and there are three themes that emerge out of the two incidents. One is the proper use of the Sabbath. Another is Jesus's claim that he is its master and arbiter. And the third is that the Sabbath must not deter a person from the good that God commands of us. The Sabbath day was important to the Jews. It was important because it was of divine institution. God himself had established it and, and based it upon his own Sabbath rest on the seventh day of creation. But also he intended it as a means of distinguishing Israel from the other nations as belonging to him and to serve as a reminder to the people that he had redeemed them out of bondage in Egypt in the Exodus. And Moses had emphasized to them in Deuteronomy chapter 5 that they were to observe the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God brought you out of there by a mighty hand and by an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. And because it was to be observed, think about this, because it was to be observed every seventh day, uh, one's adherence to it could be measured uh, every week. So the Sabbath observance uh, permeated uh, the social fabric of Jewish life. God had intended it to be that way. He had established it uh, for them. Well, Luke, uh, in his gospel, places uh, these Sabbath confrontations with the Pharisees immediately following uh, his illustration of the wedding feast at which the attendant to the bridegroom ought to have been rejoicing instead of mourning and fasting. And so perhaps his purpose, Luke's purpose, was to underscore that even the manner in which they observed the Sabbath should be characterized by joy and thanksgiving and not the tedium of legalism. And so we read our passage, now it happened that he was passing through, this is Luke 6 verse 1, now it happened that he was passing through some grain fields on the Sabbath, and his disciples were picking the heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands, and eating the grain. But some of the Pharisees said, why do you do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And Jesus answering them said, have you not even read what David did when he was hungry, he and those who were with him, how he entered the house of God, and took and ate the consecrated bread, which is not lawful for any to eat except the priest alone, and he gave it to his companions. And he was saying to them, <clears throat> the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. On another Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching, and there was a man there whose right hand was withered. The scribes and the Pharisees were watching him closely to see if he healed on the Sabbath so that they might find reason to accuse him. But he knew what they were thinking, and he said to the man with the withered hand, get up and come forward. And he got up and came forward. And Jesus said to them, I ask you, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save a life or to destroy it? After looking around at them all, he said to him, stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored. But they themselves were filled with rage and discussed together what they might do 
to Jesus. Well, the idea of a, a period of Sabbath rest runs throughout the Old Testament, not only uh, the requirement of rest on the seventh day of the week, but also other periods of time designated as Sabbaths to God. We should hasten to say at the beginning that like much of the Mosaic law, it served as a shadow of something more fundamentally real and important. The author of Hebrews in Hebrews chapters three and four identifies its link to the ultimate Sabbath rest that God intends for those who belong to him. Ancient Israel, uh, after the Exodus, uh, disobeyed the Lord and thus failed to enter God's promised rest. Uh, but even when Joshua led them uh, into the promised land, that was only a foretaste of God's ultimate rest. For if Joshua had given them rest, the author of Hebrews wrote, the Lord would not have spoken of another day after that. So there remains, he wrote, a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For the one who has entered his rest has himself also rested from his works as God did from his. And later he says, we who have believed enter that rest. So we should note that reality behind uh, the Old Testament's Sabbath requirements. The Sabbath was a gift from God and will one day be realized uh, in all its glory, uh, all its joy. Uh, I was just thinking this week, pushing the alarm clock and uh, not wanting to, uh, wanting to rest some more. And one day we'll have the complete, joyful, glorious, spiritual rest that God has for us. But the Sabbath was also part and parcel of the law God gave through Moses. It was one of the Ten Commandments, and thus it reflected God's will for his people. The law was given to them for their benefit, that they might know what God required of them and what he forbade. Uh, God is holy, and as Peter wrote in 1 Peter chapter 1, like the Holy One who called them, they were to be holy themselves in all their behavior. Just as, yeah, just as it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. The, the law reflected God's holiness. And that idea that the law reflected God's holiness was important to the Pharisees in Jesus' day. And we, we must give them credit for that. Uh, but because of that, they erected this overlay of specific rules on top of it in an attempt to more carefully define the laws and ensure that the people did not inadvertently violate its provisions. And uh, this class, you're familiar uh, with these things, you've been taught them before, some of the ridiculous rules and, and restrictions that became the consequence of that. Uh, the rabbis had drawn up uh, a list of 39 categories that they considered to be work. This, these are the 39 categories of work. And then within uh, those categories, uh, subdiv they subdivided those into six minor uh, categories under each, uh, all of which were expressly forbidden on the Sabbath. And students of the period like to say that the rabbis erected fences around the laws in order to protect the faithful from committing these forbidden trespasses. If on, uh, Dan used this when he taught uh, the, the Gospel of Luke, if on a Sabbath a, a tailor, for example, went out of his house with a needle in his pocket, he was guilty of practicing his, practicing his trade, uh, of, of working. Uh, one could not eat an egg that had been laid on uh, the Sabbath, and so on. There's a multitude of these. But we see these twisted interpretations of the law in the passage before us this morning. But Jesus refused to allow them to bury the real intent of the law under this mountain of man-made foolish traditions. Jesus did not reject the law. Uh, it was he who said, after all, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it until heaven and earth pass away, not the slightest jot or tittle, not the 
not the slightest letter or stroke, shall pass from the law until all of it is accomplished. But if you turn back in your gospel two or three pages, uh, you'll remember in chapter 4, I only have to turn back one page, you'll remember in chapter 4 and verse 18, in the synagogue, when Jesus asked for the scroll of the book of Isaiah, he found the place where it was written, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are oppressed, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And after that, as we continued our study, he put into practice what he had claimed. He immediately cast out a demon uh, out of a possessed man and then he healed uh, Simon's mother-in-law and, and a steady line of suffering souls who came uh, to their door. After bringing Peter, James, and John into uh, his uh, circle, he healed the leper uh, and then the paralytic. <clears throat> he told him his sins were forgiven, which is to say he saved him. He saved him from his sins and and then he gleefully found levi we we looked at this two weeks ago uh, the hated tax collector sitting in his tax booth and and he turned him into his his own uh, disciple when levi or, or matthew put on this joyous feast in his honor and the pharisees objected he reminded them of a verse in the prophets hosea 6 verse 6 I desire compassion and not your empty sacrifices. Now the commandments and ceremonies of the law in one sense uh, laid out what God required of man, but they didn't express it in totality. Uh, Micah 6 verse 8, a verse we're all familiar with, gives the better summary. He has told you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly uh, with your God. Jesus, uh, Jesus was kind. <laughs> you read the Gospels, uh, he, he was kind. I, I, I think we all understand that sometimes even true Christians, true believers in Jesus are not kind. Uh, but he was. Uh, he believed it was fitting to keep the law, but he didn't allow it to interfere with kindness and goodness. Let, let me illustrate that. Uh, in John chapter 5, at the pool of Bethesda, he healed a man who had been sick for 38 years. And it was the Sabbath. It was the Sabbath day. And the Jewish leaders, uh, rather than... Uh, marveling or rejoicing, uh, put out a search party to hunt him down and punish him. And so later in chapter 7 of, of John, uh, there was this confrontation, the inevitable confrontation between the two. And uh, the, law, the Lord didn't back down, insisting that it was they who did not observe the law correctly because they lacked mercy and were seeking to kill him as he went about dispensing mercy. Well, the, jaw, the Jews allowed a person, a child, to be circumcised on the Sabbath. Uh, they allowed that. Uh, they gave uh, circumcision kind of its own stature, uh, independent of the law. So Jesus accused them in verse 23 of John 7, if a man receives circumcision on the Sabbath, so that the law of Moses will not be broken. Are you angry with me because I made an entire man well on the Sabbath? Uh, the, the legalist party of the Jews had missed the whole point of the Holy Sabbath. If they had understood it correctly, they would have seen that deeds of mercy like Jesus's were not merely permitted, they were 
obligatory. Well, as I said, uh, there's my long uh, introduction, uh, but I think it provides the background for the two incidents before us. I've labeled uh, this first one, a good walk spoiled. Uh, for the golfers here, you get that. It was Mark Twain's witty summary of a, a round of golf, a, a good walk spoiled. And the less golf I've played over the years, the more I sympathize with that. That was a good walk uh, spoiled. But here, uh, Luke portrays a very busy Lord Jesus making his way to yet another destination. They were going from place to place to place and his disciples struggling to keep up with him. It was the Sabbath and they were wading through some grain fields. Uh, they lived in, in a rural society. We can't do that today. You got barbed wire fences everywhere, but they, they were making their way uh, through these grain fields and the disciples became hungry. So as they walked, they, they took advantage of an established uh, custom at the time. Uh, they were picking the heads of grain, rubbing them in their hands, and eating the grain. The law made provision for this. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 23 details how God's people uh, were to interrelate with one another. And in verse 25 of Deuteronomy 23, the, the situation was envisioned when one might enter a neighbor's standing uh, grain uh, passing through and explicitly allowing the traveler uh, to pluck the heads of the grain with their hands and have a little snack. Uh, they were allowed the same license uh, going through, through the vineyards. Uh, they could pick grapes uh, and eat until, uh, the passage says, until they were, until they were satisfied. They weren't allowed uh, to, the gather, to gather the grapes into a basket to take home. Hey, look at the grapes I, I got out in my neighbor's field. Uh, they weren't allowed to carry a sickle into the grain, grain fields uh, either. The provision was rather to provide sustenance to those passing through. It was a good deed, uh, an expression of kindness and hospitality to allow such a thing as that. So the rub with the Pharisees as they observed Jesus' disciples doing this was not that they were doing it per se, but that they were doing it on the Sabbath. Uh, they found, most of you have been taught this passage before, so this will ring a bell with you, but it's, it's really ridiculous. But they found in the plucking of the ears of grain a breach of the regulation which forbade reaping. And in the rubbing in their hands, uh, that which prohibited threshing. Uh, throwing away the husk uh, probably represented winnowing. And eating, they ate, showed that they had prepared a meal. Uh, as Leon Morris uh, comically noted, four distinct breaches of the Sabbath in one mouthful. <laughs> the Pharisees insisted that the disciples were working on the Sabbath. So they asked them, why do you do what is not lawful on the Sabbath? And Jesus answered for uh, his disciples. I'm sure he was frustrated uh, with the examiners, indignant, but instead of reacting, he directed a scripture to them. He always did that, and he did it with ease. He pulled a scripture uh, out of the air. He knew the scriptures. Uh, Perhaps there was the tiniest uh, dig at them in the way he introduced it. Have you not read? <laughs> I've read it. Have you not uh, read it? Uh, the scripture was out of 1 Samuel 21 in, in the scene where David was hurriedly fleeing from Saul with his band of men. Uh, they'd had no time to prepare. They, they had fled in a rush, so they had nothing to eat. And they were hungry. And so when they arrived at the shrine at Nob, David entered the house of God uh, to uh, seek the assistance of the priest. His name was Ahimelech. Uh, 
and uh, they needed something to eat, and they needed weapons, if he happened to have any weapons uh, with him there. And Ahimelech just so happened to have that sword that uh, Goliath had used in battle, so he gave him the sword. Uh, but he had nothing for them to eat uh, but the, the bread of the presence. It was the show bread uh, required to be placed before the Lord in the temple as prescribed by Leviticus 24 verses 5 through 9 and and therefore it was it was to be eaten only by uh, the priests after a certain number of days I think a week had passed they would take the bread put fresh bread in and then the priests could eat the the show bread uh, but Ahimelech <clears throat> considering the, the 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 dire circumstances Helped along, you remember, by a small fib David offered to grease the skids a, a bit. He offered them the bread. Uh, in Ahimelech's eyes, and David's too, uh, the needs of him and his uh, band overrode the kind of cold legalism that would have left them traveling as famished refugees. That's what David had done. Uh, that's what he did, and Jesus argued uh, under the principle that legitimate human need must not be subjected to legal niceties. He was implying that David had the right to behave as he had, and that he himself had the same authority, but to an infinitely higher degree as the greater son of David, reinforced even more when he pointedly added, and this is in Mark's version of the account, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. In cases of man's need, uh, ceremonial rites, like the use of the bread of the presence, uh, being only the means to a deeper end must give way to a higher moral law. In other words, Jesus was saying, if you had understood the scriptures and above all that the Lord requires of you not only to do justice, but also to love kindness, you would not have condemned my hungry disciples for plucking a few heads of grain on the Sabbath. And then in verse five, uh, the Lord added another justification for what they were doing. Uh, this one different in magnitude from the previous, he was saying to them, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. Now this is taking his argument a, a giant leap beyond. This is the second time in Luke's Gospel as we have encountered Jesus refer to himself as the Son of Man and significantly the first was a page back in verse 24 of chapter five where he referred to himself as having the authority to forgive sins. The son of man has authority to forgive sins and the scribes and the Pharisees there reacted according to what they had considered the outrageousness of that claim. Who can forgive sins, they said, but God alone. But the title was his favorite self-designation uh, mysteriously in the eyes of his enemies, uh, tying him to the vision of Daniel in Daniel chapter seven. Uh, there, remember, Daniel beheld one like a son of man coming up to the ancient of days and, and to this man, to this son of man was given dominion, glory, and the kingdom that all the peoples, nations, and men of every language might serve him. His dominion would be an everlasting dominion, his kingdom, one which will not be destroyed. But his enemies could not use that designation to definitively convict him of blasphemy because it could also have been interpreted simply as an elevated self-representation of man in general. Uh, but now, to say, for Jesus to say that he was Lord of the Sabbath, that was a, a staggering claim uh, to make because the Sabbath was undeniably a divine institution. 
combined with his reference to David, understood by all to be the ultimate progenitor of Messiah, his greater son, whom God had promised to send to, the, to be their savior, this was a double claim. Jesus was making a double claim. He was not just claiming for himself the designation of Messiah, but he was also claiming an authority tantamount to that of God himself with respect to the true meaning of the law. And so we read the passage, we're building toward outrage uh, here, in, and, and this is one reason why Jesus was precariously close in their eyes to claiming for himself deity. And now beginning with uh, verse uh, six and his account of the healing of the man with the withered hand, Luke amplifies Jesus's claim, taking it uh, beyond uh, the possibility of just cheap talk to a demonstration of its reality. As with the paralytic, compare it. Uh, as with the paralytic in chapter uh, five, where Jesus's claim to the, the authority to forgive sins is then proven by his power to heal. That's what happened there. Uh, so here, the lordship of the Son of Man over the Sabbath is given visible reality by this miraculous healing. It was another Sabbath, Luke writes, and again, Jesus was in the synagogue uh, teaching, as was his custom. And there was a man there whose right hand uh, was withered. Uh, Luke would have noticed that little addition. It was his right hand that made it doubly uh, worse. It's likely the man some, suffered from some sort of muscular atrophy. Uh, and the years of immobility had, had rendered his arm, his, his hand, a grotesque uh, deformity. Had the man <clears throat> been planted there uh, in the synagogue by Jesus' enemies? We can't know for sure, but verse 7 advises that they were there watching him closely to see if he healed on the Sabbath so they, they might find reason to accuse him. But Jesus knew what they were thinking. Uh, perhaps out of his omniscience, maybe, but possibly only because of innate perception. And so he accepted the, the unspoken challenge and preemptively called for the man with the withered hand to come forward to the front so that all could see him step right up here. There they all are, there you are. And here we need to pause and consider that the Pharisaic Sabbath law was clear as it regarded healing on the Sabbath day. Uh, only in situations in which the life of the person was in jeopardy was it lawful to treat or attempt to heal a person. Non-life-threatening sickness or injury could wait for another day. It can wait till the, later in the day at the end of the Sabbath, and that was the case here. And so the scribes and the Pharisees were keenly eyeing the proceedings. The verb Luke uses uh, conveys the idea of watching someone in order to see what they're going to do, even of maliciously of watching them. You've done that before, haven't you? <laughs> what are they going to do? Uh, that's what Jesus was doing. I mean, that's what the Pharisees were doing. They hadn't come to worship. They weren't in the synagogue uh, to worship. Uh, neither had they come uh, in obedience uh, to God, but they had come to defend their traditions, uh, preserve their rituals, and, and above all, with murder in their hearts. They were looking for an excuse to accuse Jesus as the conclusion of our account attests. They had no interest in the suffering a man, uh, for them, the man was nothing but a prop to advance their merciless 
cause. Jesus would say, blessed are the merciful, uh, for they shall receive mercy. mercy. Well, these watchers were utterly unmerciful. But the Lord was ready to meet their challenge head on. He said to them, I ask you, is it lawful to do good or, do har- to, or to do harm on the Sabbath, to, to save a life or to destroy it? And then he apparently uh, paused for a moment. Luke said he was looking around at them all. The pause for effect. There was an uncomfortable silence and no one spoke or replied to his his question. Matthew, according to Matthew's account in Matthew 12, uh, when they just flat could not answer him, uh, but continued to sit silent before him, he answered the question for them. He said to them, what man is there among you who has a sheep? And if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out. How much more valuable then is a man than a sheep? So then it's lawful to do good on the Sabbath. It was a brilliant answer as usual, and it highlighted the difference between the ethical purity of Jesus and the corruption of the Jewish leaders. For Jesus... It was not just a question of healing on the Sabbath and the lawfulness of that. It was a question of doing good. It was a question of doing good. The Mosaic law was never intended to prevent God's people from doing good. God is good. God is great. God is good, right? Jesus is good. And it goes without saying that those who belong to God, we should have the same nature as as him. And so at that, uh, whatever silence remained, Jesus broke it. Uh, The Lord, uh, he, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he did so, and his hand was restored. The compassion and mercy of Jesus had won out again. The Lord of the Sabbath would not be deterred from doing good. And the man with the withered hand stretched out his hand. The one thing he had been entirely unable to do. Now, we often look to this passage uh, as an illustration of the sovereign grace of our Lord in in overcoming our own spiritual uh, inability. Uh, Jesus' healing of the the man is a a wonderful picture of the salvation that comes to every person saved by God's grace. What he asked the man to do, to stretch out his hand, was the precise thing he had been completely unable to do. But that doesn't prevent Jesus from giving him the command, stretch out your hand. He had, I don't think there's any doubt, tried to do that before, perhaps in the night, dreamed that he could, awoke in the morning, still withered. Such frustration came over him. Perhaps he'd given up on any hope that he could ever stretch out his hand. It's possible even that various healers, so-called, had come along over the years claiming to be able to heal him, and and they too had commanded him to stretch out his hand, but to no avail. It was because the man was unable to do what was commanded of him. The difference this time was that with the command came also the ability. God gave him the ability. In the same way, the Bible teaches the inability of man to come to God in faith. It teaches the uh, inability of a person unaided to trust in Christ and believe in him and receive the spiritual healing which will make him whole. The Apostle Paul wrote in Romans 8 verse 8 that those in the flesh cannot please God. 
Uh, the mind set on the flesh, Paul says, is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God. It's not even able to do so. And again in 1 Corinthians 2.14, that the natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they're spiritually appraised. These themes are repeated elsewhere. We've heard them uh, over and over again, and they're wonderful because of the happy result at the end. A person without the Spirit of God, bound in the state of natural human flesh, unaided by the power of the Spirit of God, is totally unable to do one thing, that will bring him or her to God and find spiritual healing and forgiveness. Like the man with the withered hand, one must experience the irresistible, enabling call of the Savior in order to reach out and, and come to him. And it's happened to each one of us as he called us to him. We were unable, but he called us. Well, the, this poor man experienced that call. That was the call that he heard. But sadly, Christ's enemies remained fast bound in their sin and their hostility. Luke concludes the account in verse 11. They were filled with rage and discussed together what they might do to Jesus. Matthew says they went out and conspired against him as to how they might destroy him. Well, the Pharisees were uh, self-proclaimed uh, lovers and keepers of the law, but their actions betrayed their hearts. If they had truly known God, truly had a relationship with him, they would have un understood the, the important insight that Jesus made once when asked by a probing lawyer sent specifically by Jesus' enemies, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Which is the greatest? And you know how Jesus replied. He said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the great and foremost commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Well, the scribes and the Pharisees of the Gospels that we have read about so often failed to meet the challenge of either, but the most visible failure, the most visible failure, the one that manifested itself most clearly was that they had no love or kindness for others. Jesus made it visible by the contrasting attitude that he put on display. And so the obvious question for us is, are we like Jesus? Are we like him? Or do we too often, every now and then, slip into that kind of empty re religiosity and forsake uh, the mercy to others that is the hallmark of spirit-filled uh, disciples of Christ. Well, may God give us the grace uh, to uh, uh, have that humble uh, attitude uh, toward ourselves and toward others to grant us a heart of compassion, mercy, love, uh, other, other, otherness, uh, that looks uh, not just to our own causes, our own agenda, but looks to God's children uh, surrounding us wherever we go, not just today in this building, but today at lunch, in your neighborhood, uh, in the fields this week. Lord, we do pray for that because uh, you have called us uh, with irresistible grace, you have given us new hearts, uh, but we know we're still filled uh, with indwelling sin.
We struggle uh, with obeying you. We struggle with the world, the flesh, and the devil. And uh, we're, we're, we, we tend to be selfish people. So we need your grace. We need the same grace that saved us to make us merciful and kind and uh, to mirror uh, the person of our Savior. We pray in his name. Amen.